We are going to go on to the next component. And this one we're going to spend a little more time on because really with the guidelines K through 12, you have to sit down and have specific activities in mind as you're evaluating them and fitting them into your units. They do in the book give you examples in the text of things that could be listed. Okay, but for your needs and to help make it clear of how these activities and things can be developed and how they can be looked at, I want you to, did you all pick up this one handout? It's the uh, summary of environmental yes. education guidelines for excellence. This is the summary of the areas that are, were identified and are used by environmental education specialists as they are creating curriculum or creating activities or people that are writing materials up for use in education. These are the areas in which we ask of the environmental world to address as you're bringing these things forth. And as teachers, we would like you to look at these areas and see if it's, if it's applied. Okay? Because these are sometimes things, and these are the first one is especially the hallmark of environmental education and sort of our credo as to how we address things, is that we want to have fairness and accuracy, which is extremely hard to get to provide sometimes. Accuracy, yes. Fairness, not so much. Okay? And that is the creed of environmental education, is that it is to show kids how to think, not what to think. So we'd like that carried over into the education field is that you're providing them information and opportunities to develop and an analyze information and create their own opinions from that. Okay? So there has to be a method of looking at things and the skills we have to teach students as well as educators to evaluate what is being said, presented, or done. And that's what the Guideline of Excellence for Materials addresses. It looks at these areas and says, well, how can we make sure what we're presenting in the classroom is fair and accurate? How can we make sure that it has depth to it, that it has action orientation, that it's not just speaking to the children, that they have some application that they have to do a physical action to? All environmental education wants is to have students apply their activities. So we want to develop stewardship pro pro um, programs and pos possibilities in your school. So when you're thinking in green leaf terms and saying, well, how are we going to get kids to take on a, an action-oriented plan? Are they going to come up with a recycling plan for our school, a water conservation plan? How do they get to those plans? Do they need to have an organic garden? Do they need to have you know, more composting associated? How do they get to that thought and get to the action is what you're going to be building into what they're learning. So we have this book. And to help you with the use of this book, also online and now on Blackboard, is a workbook. And this explains in depth our six areas that are listed up here that we're going to be looking at and evaluating materials with. So it has activities to test your skills of looking at certain pieces of information for fairness, depth, emphasis of skill building, action orientation, instructional soundness, and usability. Now, if you notice on here, I have changed the text of four of those six items because I have copied the workbook activity <laughs> from and will give you those pages and we're going to work on those at this time. So you can start to see how it go is going to be applied later on when you're home on the 4th of July kicking back saying, hey, I think I'm going to evaluate some material. <laughs> so we're going to do some of these exercises. And we're going to start with those four because those are the four that really we sometimes overlook when we're looking for activities and things to put into a classroom. But they are the core concept of what we want seen in what we build into the classroom. So when we're looking at fairness and accuracy, which is number one on our list, you can look at either the executive summary, that's what I'm going to be reading off, or you can follow along in the guidelines material book as well. There are four areas in which we want to evaluate that accuracy and, and fairness. Is it factually correct? Is it going to be balanced presentation of differing viewpoints and theories? Okay, so that's the tricky part that sometimes we, we don't always apply in. Is it open to inquiry? 
so that the students can start to ask questions of those theories? And is it reflective of diversity? Okay, so on your first page of your handout I just gave you, it has an activity that we are going to be looking at and critiquing, rather, not criticizing, we're critiquing, <laughs> as to whether or not those statements could be utilized if you're going to be um, presenting it to a, a, a classroom. What makes it accurate? What things would you be looking for to make a, a statement or something that you're going to be speaking out to or quoting in your classroom accurate? What are you looking for? Just off the top of your head, reliable what would you? It ha first of all, reliable source, but does it give a source? So is it cited and is it a reliable source? So if it's some kid hands in a paper that says Wikipedia, is that, that's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So Wikipedia may not be your reliable source. So they have to have, where did Wikipedia get that information? And that's what you want the kids to go and find that piece of information that's quoted in Wikipedia before they write down Wikipedia. And then they're going to cite it from there. What else would, may, would you look for to, to identify it as accurate? Could it be actual, if they actually list facts or if they just use sweeping statements, then you could actually check whether that was true or not. Exactly. And with your sweeping statements, they ask you to look at the use of language, which is really good if you want to tie this into a language arts activity as well. Mm -hmm. If you're giving them a report, or they are to do a research, part of that is to look at what language is used in the presentation of the material. Is it inflammatory language? Is it one point of view being expressed? And you can tell that the language is pointing you in that direction. That's the propaganda type language. Okay, another thing you want to look for is dates. You know, if they quote, the earth is flat, <laughs> because they read that in an old book <laughs> or an article about an old theory, but they did not recognize it's an old theory, you would not present that to your students. You wouldn't want your students to include that as a fact in a written document or something like that. But there are some things that are old that never ever change. Okay, so if they talk about the Water Act of 1970, I think it was 76, you know, that pretty much is, is a stated document what was stated in the water. It's been revised, but some of it is quoted and factual and will stay statistically sound. I so if there's, sorry. yep? Like for something like that, like, I mean, you know, the earth is flat kind of thing, is it ever appropriate, do you think, to kind of show them the progression of that or ask them to go look at how, what changed the person's sure. mind or what changed this group of people's thinking and, how, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. You could certainly do that. Is here's what was believed in 1712. Here's what believed now. How did we evolve into that? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you could certainly do that for older groups. Cuz they wouldn't know the difference always. Uh, at least I know with my group, they don't understand theory. Mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, I obviously that's not, but you know, so for them to be able to actually have that capacity to say this is this might not be you know, this can't be proven, so this might not be a fact, this might be a theory. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. so exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You could, do, you could take them into that realm. Mm -hmm. um, it's ma mainly looking at materials that you as a teacher, that are, you're going to reference for your students. Okay. So you're evaluating these materials. Okay. With the older high school students, you're going to teach them the skills of how to evaluate what they might be using okay. is our focus there. Mm -hmm. um, one of, uh, an example of that is that um, many times I've gone into a school and they're talking about air pollution and ozone mm -hmm. and the teacher sa has said, and you'll see posters, so obviously this has been perpetuated, about get rid of aerosols to save ozone. It has not been a problem. Aerosols have gone since the 80s. Mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> so they're using an old reason, which was true, it was very true, as aerosols did the, have problems with the ozone level but they're using that as a present day problem. Okay. So it's already happened, you know, mm -hmm. we've already taken that out. So in that case, that's when that dated material, in fact, is no longer applicable. Okay, so we gotta look at what's the problem with our ozone and our climate change and our 
our carbons, stuff like that. So that now gives them a bigger picture, because before we were just talking about ozone. And then they found out all the other stuff was happening too. Mm -hmm. so, so with those, yep? Yeah, you also want to be careful of the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. What you were talking about, I think, really was a hypothesis, okay. because a theory is essentially accepted scientific proof. It's something that's supported by, by okay. experimentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's not... The hypothesis is still being tested. Right. Okay. okay. We aren't testing that flatness of Earth anymore. Right. right. We've walked it. it yeah. You go around and around. <laughs> okay. So we found that out. So on our first page is an activity that has asks you to read down these quotes and first you're going to say, ask whether or not would you use this information as is, yes or no, and then write any concerns or observations that you see about that information. So if you were presenting this in your classroom, would this fact be utilized? Okay, which one of those statements do you think you would use? Which one would you use? Um, a couple of them. Okay. I actually really like the one about science has confirmed mm -hmm. that Mr. Ford's yeah. new internal mm -hmm. combustion. Just sort of as an interesting historical reference. I mean, it's yeah. clearly not current, mm -hmm. but automobile emissions are in fact still a current problem. And from the get-go. As far yeah. back as 1914. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and for, for kids to see that, you know, mm -hmm. more, that 100 years ago, people were already concerned about these emissions, I think is, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one you would use? Yeah. OK. Thank you, Mr. Sam. I would use number three as an example of the word <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> See, that's the thing is, you can use any of these, and you can not use any of these. This is strictly your opinion as to whether or not you would use them. The question is, how, what were your observations of it? So, in stating you would use Mr. Ford's quote here, that there were concerns of admission, what are the concerns of that observation? What would you have to, do you have any concerns about it? Um, or your observations of it? Not concerns, but. Well, it's, it's clearly not a current record. We mm -hmm. don't know what science they're talking about. Science is just what was science like voice. in 1914? Yeah. <laughs> Go in and breathe a lot. See if you cough. <laughs> yeah. But you could still use it, right? It, to yeah. teach the historical perspective, exactly. It could be part of a timeline. Sure. So yours, you would use um, the number three double-blind study. But your concerns in using it is you would have to explain. I would say, okay. What's wrong with this? <laughs> Please tell me what's wrong yeah, with this. There something wrong. I mean, or is there something <laughs> wrong? Exactly. Exactly. Yes? I mean, I feel the same way about number five. I think it's, it's worth bringing into class as a quotation, if you can find the citation, worth, worth evaluating. Five? Number five. Oh, something, something worth evaluating, mm -hmm. especially if you can find the citation. Mm -hmm. I think you could juxtapose four and five together and say these are two diametrically opposed viewpoints. Right. Both, Both of which facts. are, yeah, basically factless or mm -hmm. out and out uh, inaccurate. It, in the state of number, I mean, electric cars are inexpensive. I would beg to differ, but <laughs> I would own one if they were that. Depends but, your uh, tax bracket. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I think it, that's an interesting, if that's your uh, thing, too, when you're having them research claims, I think that would be a great way to juxtapose it. With the one about the plants, I like that one. Which number was that? It, number three, again, to mm -hmm. go back to that, what I would like to have kids do is know when they say smoke is actually good for house plants. Where do they come up with the definition of good? Where are the mm -hmm. data that led them to believe it's good? And this could be a good discussion with them about, you know, I'd like to see this study, and I would like to see what the data are, and mm -hmm. I would like to see how this person came up with good, because what are your parameters? And you can't necessarily say it's wrong, because I haven't seen the data. Maybe the data that were totally skewed and actually showed that the plants grew more, and based on that, but this drives me crazy. You see, research says, and then there's this, it's good for you. you know? And that's the key thing, is if you're using current information from articles or magazines and things like that, 
you know, you want them to learn what is inflammatory language, what mm -hmm. is a leading opinion language, right. okay, right. and, so and go back and search the source. For, yeah. for yeah. one particular says. plant. Oh, yeah. it's what the, yeah. the internet of truth. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yes. I mean, are you high school teacher? Yeah. yeah. So I think high school kids have a different way of looking at information than you have back at information in you know, the fourth grade. Mm -hmm. We did this with the younger students. They take it as true. Mm -hmm. So your grade level, you're going to be specially keyed into that fairness objective thing. You'd be surprised at how, how much high school and every, the world takes well, yeah. documents as gospel. Yeah, there's lots of, right. you know. As long as you put it somewhere that looks impressive. Urban and myths out there. Good, and someone semi-reliable or. Someone that they think is reliable. Right, looks professional. Yeah. It could You're be a homeless person from the street. They put them in a suit. Yeah. And That's what we're asking you to evaluate right. and to teach that evaluation yeah. skill. So in the yeah. elementary yeah. grades, they may be doing it for the student. By the time you're getting into 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, you're mm -hmm. asking the student to evaluate those things. You know, the, the common common myth in, uh, that always comes around working in the state parks, it's illegal to kill praying mantis. It's not true. I've heard that too. I, it, <laughs> no, never. Is it, is it a Who got fined? You did. You killed it. How, how would they know? I don't know. <laughs> did you uh, ever know of anybody ever being fined? Where is We have a limited number of conservation officers in the park. It's our state insect, but doesn't mean you can't. Is there a law against killing state things? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm telling you. No. Our our <laughs> only for the state mammal. Somebody should make a law. <laughs> you can also cut mountain laurel. That's our state flower. You can cut mountain. You can hug it, too. But <laughs> hug it before you cut it. <laughs> then it's better. I remember I grew up. In Minnesota, and it's a lady slipper is the state flower. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a little kid, oh, we can't pick that. It's the state flower. That's another reason. Don't pick that. Yeah. But yeah. Lady slipper, if you pick them, the they don't regrow. No. Oh, okay. They only grow where they grow because they're growing with a, a fungus that's associated with rotting oak trees oh, that in that area. So that's why if you transplant them, they just don't grow. So oh, no. that's that reason. Okay. Cool. Is the Colorado Columbine like that as well? I feel like there was something like I know the Colorado Columbine has a huge, like a five hundred dollar fine if you pick it. Because I've friends told it? the story about a girl who had made this beautiful, like well, oh, no. wreath of Columbine. He's like, take it off. Like, you Did she get fined? Well, no. One, he told her to take it off before he was caught. There was no one out there to see her, but they were out. Camping. So, it may or may not be true. Or is it, it like the tree falls in the woods? Like if you pick it, no one sees it. It may not even be a law. Yeah, but it might not be a law. Here's the other mer myth. Another myth that it was presumed a fact is that they said ketchup was a vegetable in school cafeteria. Never written as a law. Never written down. It was proposed in the 80s by a senator. Why don't we make it in his orientation? Oh yeah, I've heard of In his speech, made it but it never got written in. It never got I made it. into it. But that has, that's the propaganda influence of language. And then we take it into meaning it is truism. <laughs> because it's also economically, you want to believe that if you're paying You want to. You want to, but it never got that bad <laughs> that they would actually count it. Never got that bad. So that's why we have to make sure we're looking for dates, sightings. You know, if, if it's a law, then let's find out who, who was fined. Who, has that ever been carried out type thing? Okay, so those are things of fairness and accuracy. Very key important part when we're addressing environmental things because some things are not completely fair and accurate. And when we're presenting it to our students, we have to make sure we're presenting fair and accurate information. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the second area of depth. And this is different again for developmental levels just like it's, it, all areas are, but you want to have material that has some depth to it. This is key and one of our things that we have problems with environmental educators, formal and informal, is that we present an activity, but we do not link it with an introduction and a closure 
that integrates it back into the classroom. So it becomes the game. We don't want these things strictly seen as a game that you can do with the kids. So when it's the end of school year, we get lots of calls from schools, five days left in the school system, and they say, can we come out to your center and you do uh, testing the waters? That's one of our programs. And I say, well, yeah, but we, don't, we normally don't do them this late. Go, oh, gosh, we just need you to do something. I can tell there's no depth requirement to that request. <laughs> I am here for the last five days of a hot summer, and we're trying to fill it. So can you come in and do it? Yeah, play in the water. Sure, let them play with some chemical tests, watch for color change, must be great. Okay, that is not something we want to do. If you're going to do it, it has to have a valuable connection, and our job as educators is to introduce the topic, and then after the activity session of it, explain how does it relate or relate it back throughout your day or weeks of your unit. That's the depth that we're looking for. When we're evaluating materials, we want to see, are those materials written with some depth to them? Not just saying you're going to put worms in a worm, worm bin and you're going to weigh the worm bin every week and find out how much soil is, collected, is generated. And identify that as the difference between the added weights or the change in weight. Written up just as an activity. You want to see some, some meaning to it. So that's our depth activity. It looks at, and in this case, NAAAE has identified Bloom's taxonomy as the measuring point to measure depth of materials. Only because most people are utilize Bloom's taxonomy or have been familiar with it. So in the second page, when you turn, you have this lovely sheet with the answers on mine filled in. But <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to look at those objectives. And that's one of the things you're going to look for in materials. Are there goals and objectives? What's the difference between a goal and an objective? Anybody know? Goals are just an objective. your individual steps to get to your goal. Exactly. Also, objectives are measurable. So your objective is going to ask, you want them to be able to identify five insects that are found in their field. You, know, you want them to identify two adaptations for each one of our animals studied. Things like that. That's a specific measurable goal. In mathematics, they would be able to solve X number of equations, X number of types of um, variables, things like that. So objectives are very, very easily measured. And for this activity, you're going to be identifying the objective verb, that's the action verb we're looking for, and you're going to match it with their learning level. Is it a knowledge base? Is it evaluation? Is it ana uh, analysis, synthesis, um, comprehension, things like that, using those Bloom taxonomy learning levels. So where are these objectives found? They are found in, let me see if I, your hand out. in the write-ups. They are supposed to be in your write-ups on your... Oh, so you go like to... These, these are where you're going to find them. The little green book, yes, on material evaluation. Your objectives are going to be found under the... Well, I saw it a second ago. They have them listed as one, two, one. Yeah, I have the page seven. I'm looking for, you have to go through the um, six characteristics. They have their objectives under fairness and accuracy. I'm trying to get you to the right language so that you can look. Okay, so for 1.1 under fairness, on your worksheet, you see how it has objective one, two, three? Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Yes. Seven. Yep. I haven't clarified it for you yet because I. Okay, it's in the workbook. Oh, okay. 
Okay, I'm going to read it to you, the <laughs> objectives, okay. in your workbook as it's defined by um, the areas. And you are going to write down the action verb for each one of these, the objective verb. So for objective one, under fairness and accur accuracy, it states accesses materials for current, factual information, and appropriate language. What is the objective verb? That's the one you write down. What was it? Access. Access. For objective two, identify potential bias in environmental education materials. What's your action verb? Okay, number three, evaluate materials in terms of cultural and ethnic diversity. Okay, now don't give away the answers, but you're all right. Uh, okay, for two, when we're looking at depth of information, our objectives for depth are distinguished factors contributing to environmental awareness. Objective number five, under depth, demonstrate an understanding of conceptual frameworks and concepts in context. Okay, and number six, recognize the relevance and relationships of various scales. Okay. So those are the things they're looking for in depth. Like that What's that? Doesn't the last one say seventeen very visible? No. Yeah. yeah the, 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 well, the five one is this is for as you as the educator when you're evaluating the materials, you're looking for the depth, looking for relevance of re relationships in various scales. So it, it's broad because it's looking at all environmental education materials to be identified this way. But yes, it is hard. But you have to be able to recognize that as an educator, is what they're saying. Three, emphasis on skills building. Classify curriculum materials according to support of higher order thinking. So what, what's the objective? Classify. Verb? What's what? Classify. Classify, exactly. Okay, distinguish the skills necessary for issue analysis and action. Okay. Four would be your action-oriented areas. Objective is choose strategies that encourage learners to reflect on the consequences of their actions. Ten is distinguish patterns that contribute to learner empowerment. Ten, again. 10 is distinguish patterns that contribute to learner empowerment. So what's that wor verb we're looking for? Dis distinguish. Okay, usability has number, what are we on? 11, oops. Yep, I, I skipped it. Where's my file? Classify instructional methods and ways of learning. Classify. Yeah, yep, classify. Evaluate the use of various instructional environments. Differentiate the role of goals, objectives, and assessments. Okay, number six now. Uh, for number 14, the usability, we have recognized the necessary structural elements for quality environmental education materials. Mm -hmm. 15 is identify characteristics that contribute to longevity and adaptability. And then 16, assess the validity of claims and degree of correlation. Terry, that's where you were starting out today. You were checking out the validity of correlation. Okay, so those are your um, objective verbs. Now, write down what learning level do those objective verbs fall into for, that would match the Bloom's taxonomy. It's not lower than that. It's, it's probably under the standard. Oh, look. Yeah, 
Okay, let's take a look at what, are, what did we evaluate these verbs to mean, these objectives. Now keep in mind, these are the objectives that are stated for the guidelines here. So we're looking at you know, how the guidelines are actually developed so that they meet and you, has the teacher evaluating all levels of information that an activity or material might be presenting. So objective one, what level, learning level would you put that at? If, yep. Um, identify, what, which one would you put that at? Okay. Knowledge or remember. Um, then, of course, evaluate. It's evaluate. We like it when they say the same words. <laughs> Distinguish for objective four, if they're going to be distinguishing between. Mm -hmm. um, demonstrate. What's that? Could be application, could be comprehension. Or what did, what's the new one? Understanding. understanding. Yeah, so if they can demonstrate it, then it's an understood skill. Recognize. Okay. Or comprehension, yep. Uh, we're going to skip to distinguish again. Analyze. Analyze. Choose. Analyze. Okay. You have, uh, how, how did you fit it to evaluate? What did you say? Analyze for choose? choose mm -hmm. that, that seemed like the one that has the most room. Just evaluate? Choose, choose strategies to see if it could go through between level three and level five. Mm -hmm. what we okay. What is it for choose? To choose it. So you have to apply it first and then choose it. Okay. So what did we say? It could be in the application level or it could be in the evaluation. She justified it. <laughs> she synthesized. Uh, disting oh, distinguish we have again. Analyze. And finalize. Uh, classify. Understanding. Okay. Um, we're going to evaluate self-explanatory. Differentiate. Analyze. Analyze. Can understand. Could be both. Because if you're going to, again, if you're going to differentiate, you have to understand the, the two to, to be able to understand it. Um, recognize. Remember. Knowledge or remember. Identify. Remember. Okay. And assess again. There you go. So that's how these objectives for the, the evaluation of materials are laid out. So that it can apply all levels of how does this material reach our learning and our teaching objectives. Okay, so that's a key component when they design these, so that you have those six areas and that they have specific objectives within those areas. 